الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على خاتم النبيين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله نويت سنة الاعتكاف I can request the brothers to come forward, inshallah, especially the brothers at the back, the, along the divar, along the wall, to come forward, inshallah. <clears throat> Whenever you enter the masjid, try to make a habit of entering with the right foot. And upon entering, make the intention of itikaf. The reason for this is that in the masjid, when we come into the main masjid hall, it's not permissible for a person that he eats or drinks or he sleeps in the masjid. But when making the intention of Aitikaf, and this can be done in any language, you can say in Arabic, which is in a way to Sunnat al Aitikaf, you can say it in, in Urdu, you can say in English, I make intention of Nafli Aitikaf, then by just saying these words, or even not saying it, just having that intention in the, in the heart, because remember, intention means a firm a will or desire in the heart. If you have that in the heart, then it will make these things, meaning the eating, drinking, sleeping, etc., permissible in the masjid. And as long as you stay in the masjid, you will also get the reward for every second, for every moment, you are in the masjid as well. So this is just a few uh, seconds it will take in the heart, you make the intention, you can say on the word, uh, by tongue as well with the words, but the reward is immense, inshallah. So always try to make the intention as well, inshallah. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. In Muslim Imam Ahmad, a narration has been stated that Sayyidina Abdul Rahman bin Awf radiyallahu ta'ala an, he narrated that the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam once came out and he says that I followed him. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then entered into a garden and performed sajda. The sajda was so long that I feared that the blessed soul has left the, the blessed body of Rasulullah wasallam. Therefore I approached him and I looked at him closely. After this, the noble Prophet wasallam actually lifted his head up from the sajda and asked me and said, O oh, Abdul Rahman, what happened? And I told him what I had feared. I told him that I, I thought that you may have passed away. So he وسلم, said that Jibreel Amin has told me that are you not pleased that Allah has said that whoever recites Salat upon you, I will shower mercy upon him. And whoever sends Salam to you, I will grant him protection. Subhanallah. So whenever we try, try to recite through the park in a manner which is respectful, in a manner which the Prophet ﷺ will like as well, in a respectful <coughs> manner. The eyes closed, thinking of the green gumbad or the jali mubarak, sending salam in good words, and sending it not just for the sake of, you know, uh, filling the numbers, but rather from the heart as well. That is what is important. And Allah Hazir Rahmatullah he says, Wallah wa sun lenge, fariyad ko pohjenge. We from the heart and with firm uh, love and devotion, we send salam upon the Prophet وسلم, then definitely he will come to our aid, inshaAllah. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Also, another point that I just want to mention, said the Amir Ahl Sunnah Tamrak Atul Aliyah in his Madri Muzakra, he once mentioned that I like this act of this of the Turkish people. And what is that act? He says that whenever they say the name of the Prophet Sallallahu they put their hands to their heart and lower their heads out of respect. And he says that I will, inshallah, try to 
uh, do this as well whenever I remember. So you as well, so inshallah, can make the intention out of respect of the Prophet sallallahu we will try to act upon this as well. And talking about the love and affection of the Prophet sallallahu and love in itself, without loving someone, without having uh, knowing someone, a person cannot love that individual or love that thing. If I don't know about a certain individual, I can't love that person. So without knowing of the person, we cannot truly love that individual. So this principle, we can also apply on to the Prophet ﷺ, that without truly knowing about the Prophet ﷺ, who he was, who he is, and who he ﷺ, uh, was to us as an Ummati, then we cannot truly have that love in our hearts. And a way that we can understand the Prophet ﷺ is through the seerah, the biography of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And inshallah in today's bayan, we're going to cover some aspects of the biography of the Prophet ﷺ, some important points, and some points that inshallah will revive our iman as well, inshallah. In the time of the Jahiliyyah, the time of ignorance, the religion that used to be followed was Deen Ibrahimi. But even though people used to follow Deen Ibrahimi, that was also very distorted as well, the distorted religion of Deen Ibrahim. <coughs> Monotheism was replaced by polytheism and idol worship. And some of the, the, the disbelievers, they would believe in different things. For example, they would believe in the angels as, as, as a god, Allah, or the daughters of God. And they would believe in many weird and different things, things which go against Wahdaniyat against the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some people would consider the trees, the moon, the stars and the sun as, as a deity, as a god. And some people would be occupied in <coughs> idol worship. The Kaaba, which was used for the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was now filled with idols. And people's moral as well, they, the, the character and the morals of people also declined and deteriorated as well. To the extent that people would drink alcohol, would gamble excessively, would do uh, fornication, and would be very uh, vicious in killing and in bloodshed. And one of the most disgusting acts that they would do would be that they would bury their daughters alive. The newborn daughters, they would bury them alive. And some would even go to, to the extent that people would offer human sacrifice human sacrifice for the idol gods. The gods are made out of stone and wood. And in this brutal time, this was not just Mahdud to Arabia, it was not just limited to Arabia, but even far out in other places of the world, there was a lot of ignorance that was going around. And during this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blessed the world with such an individual that changed the hearts of the whole world, that turned the face of the world around, and that was Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi On the 12th of Rabiul Awwal, 55 days after the event of Ashab the, the time when uh, the Kaaba was under attack by uh, Abraha and his army. 20, uh, 55 days after this, on the 12th of Rabbil Awal, the Prophet ﷺ was born on the day of Monday. And in corresponding to uh, the Gregorian date, it's 20th April, 571. And this was at the time of dawn. At the time of dawn, the Prophet ﷺ came and blessed the world. The most shining face like moon, full of musk fragrance. He was born without a umbilical cord. So the umbilical cord that is linked to the mother for food and, and other various sources of nutrients that was already cut from before. He was born with kohal already in his eyes. The prophethood raiding uh, between his blessed shoulders. He was born with a miraculously pure and clean body. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ came in this world with both hands on the floor 
and raising his blessed head towards the sky. And it's mentioned in Fatayr al-Zabiyya, Allah Hazrat Imam Muhammad al Khan. He says that the Holy Prophet ﷺ performed sajda, performed prostration, soon after he was born. And the following supplication was on his blessed lips. Rabbi habli ummati. Rabbi habli ummati. Oh Allah, grant my ummah. Ya Allah, grant me my ummah. Shada sarkar ki amad. Marhaba. Bildar ki amad. Marhaba. Astar ki amad. Marhaba. Mazur ki amad. Marhaba. Nur ki amad. Marhaba. Allah ki akhri rabi ki amad. Marhaba. And how greatly has the poet mentioned that Rabbi habli ummati. Kehte huye, peda huye. I'm sure everyone knows these verses. Rabbi habli ummati, kehte huye, peda huye. Haq ne farmaya ke baksha aswalatu wassada. So how beautiful and miraculous was the birth of our Sayyidina Rasulullah the master of both worlds, the master of the day of judgment. You have already heard about the conditions of the Arabs and in spite of living among such brutal people, the Holy Prophet never engaged himself in any fun or any activities or games or useless things. And the personality of the most quali the blessed qualities of the Prophet ﷺ are always abstained from every evil activity. The Prophet ﷺ never was indulged in these wrongful activities that were in, uh, uh, in abundance around uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And also the blessed personality of the Holy Prophet ﷺ was rich with morals, good character, and he was known as a trustworthy person. Someone who was speaking the truth, someone who was trustworthy. And in Arabia, they actually, uh, in the time of the Prophet, the, the disbelievers of Makkah, they would call him by the titles of, of uh, Amin, meaning trustworthy, and of Siddiq, uh, of um, Amin, and of uh, truthfulness. So the Prophet was known as Sadiq and Amin, the truthful one, the one who is trustworthy. And in fact, people would entrust the Prophet ﷺ with many things. They would go out onto troubles and give all of their wealth to the Prophet ﷺ to look after. They would look after their, their, their children, their wealth, the, the flocks of, uh, of uh, herds of animals that they used to own. The Prophet ﷺ would look after these as well and were known as a trustworthy person. And when the Prophet ﷺ was at the age of 40 years old, he was... Uh, then allowed to declare his prophethood on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ was even a prophet before the creation of Adam. As the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he himself says that I was a prophet between Adam was in what was between uh, when Adam was between soul, uh, soil and the body. So the Prophet ﷺ was always a, a prophet of Allah. So the declaration of prophethood was at the age of 40 years old. The first revelation of the, of the Qur'an that was upon the Prophet ﷺ happened in the cave of Hira. <coughs> and Sayyidina Jibreel والسلام, he came in the court of the Prophet ﷺ and he recited the verses. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil qalam, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. And the translation from Ganzul Iman, read in the name of your Lord, who created man from a clot, and read, and your Lord is only the most beneficent, the one who taught to write with the pen, the one who taught man all what he did not know. So these blessed verses, they were revealed upon the Holy Prophet in the cave of Hira. Now, my dear son, brothers, from these verses, if you look at the translation, in fact, the first word, Iqra, to read. So the command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam via Sayyidina Jibreel was to read. 
And we as the Ummati of the Prophet ﷺ, we should also be a nation that is indulging in reading. And what does reading link with? Attaining knowledge. So attaining knowledge is a very important aspect of religion, a very important aspect of one's, uh, one's building, self-building, that one studies and learns the religion of Islam. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ himself, he says, that talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatin that learning knowledge to seek knowledge is fard obligatory upon every muslim man and woman so every single individual that I sat here that is uh, watching the bayan it is necessary upon them, obligatory upon them that they study and learn knowledge now a question might arise that when I read my namaz <coughs> which is first upon me, it's obligatory upon me. I perform the, the takbir and I perform the, the qiyam, the ruku, the sujood. All these things I perform. At the end, I perform the salams. Now I know I have completed my fard. I've completed my obligatory, uh, obligatory act upon me. So, how do I know that I have completed my obligatory knowledge? So, the scholars of Islam, they have mentioned a few categories and a few important points of how one can understand that what things are obligatory upon him to learn because not learning every single aspect of religion is obligatory what is obligatory number one is aqaid the belief belief about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belief about the anbiya ikram alayhi salatu salam belief about the quran and the and the holy scriptures belief about the angels the day of judgment belief about uh, resurrection after death, the day of Qiyamah, so all these things come under belief. So first and foremost, a person must study his aqaid, his belief. Then move on to the fiqh, the Islamic law. So the scholars of Islam have mentioned that that which is fard upon you to do, for example, praying salah is fard, fasting in the month of Ramadan is fard, performing hajj once in a, in a lifetime is fard. Okay, uh, all of these things which are further upon us, zakat, this is also so whatever is further upon us to do, to learn about that is also obligatory as well. To learn about the rulings of them things which are further upon us to do is also obligatory as well. And then more, more so, the Unwai Quran say that whatever state comes upon you, for example, you are now at the age of you are looking to get married, then learning about marriage is now necessary. If you are going into the trade and business, then learning about the rulings of trade and business are not necessary. So like this, whatever scenario comes upon you during your life, then to learn about the rulings related to that scenario is also obligatory as well. And learning knowledge, it's such a great action, such a great, immense, high respected thing, that once a Sahabi Rasul, <coughs> The Prophet ﷺ was informed by Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, that that certain Sahabi is going to pass away very soon. And the Prophet ﷺ then went to inform that Sahabi. So that companion, he asked Sayyid Rasulullah ﷺ, that what should be the best thing for me to do now? Because if you was about to die, everyone would be asking that what would be the best thing for me to do at this very point? The most superior action. So the Prophet ﷺ said, get yourself busy in learning knowledge. I'm paraphrasing that. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that to go and study about, about the religion. And if there was such an action, such an amr that was more respectable or more uh, virtuous, more than knowledge, then the Prophet ﷺ would have mentioned that at that point. So from this we can understand the importance of knowledge and seeking knowledge. We should seek knowledge even if we have to, have to travel to China, this is one of the quotes. That even if we have to travel to China, then seek knowledge. And seeking knowledge is, mashallah, we can see a lot of buzurk here, a lot of old people here with white dari, mashallah. Allah Azawajal have mercy upon them. Allah Salama that came, mashallah. So seeking knowledge is not just for the youth and just for the young people here, but it's for everyone. Learning knowledge from mahad ila lahad, from the cradle to the grave. This is what is important. So no matter what age you are at, no matter uh, what level your knowledge is at, there is no <coughs> embarrassment in going and learning and seeking Islamic knowledge. 
صلوا على الحبيب صلى الله تعالى على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. After the revelation of uh, the verses of uh, Surah uh, of Iqra, then a few other verses were revealed later on, which goes, يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر that O cloaked one, rise up and warn. <coughs> so these first ibtidais uh, ayat of Surah Mudathir, when these came, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he started to then preach about Islam, started to warn the people about the punishments of Allah and started to preach about Islam. But first he did so in a private manner. So his trustworthy people, people that were close to him, he started the tabligh, the, uh, the preaching of Islam towards them people, them individuals. Then later on, when the commandment came to preach publicly, the Prophet وسلم, then went and openly started, publicly started to preach and convey the message of Islam. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, he was from amongst the, the first, the first male man to uh, um, accept Islam. Sayyidina Ali karamallahu ta'ala wa was first amongst the youth, the boys. And Sayyidatuna Khadijatul Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha was the first woman to accept Islam. Oh. And from amongst the slaves, Sayyidina Zaid bin Harissa radiallahu ta'ala was first from amongst the slaves, uh, the freed slaves, and Bilal Habshi radiallahu ta'ala was from amongst the first slaves to embrace Islam. Oh. And when Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala when he accepted Islam, he then started to uh, along with the Prophet وسلم, go and give Neki Kidawat, call towards righteousness. And through his efforts, a few honorable Sahaba Ikram, they were honored to have embraced Islam. And through his individual efforts, five blessed individuals embraced Islam who were then honored to become amongst the Ashrai Mubashara, okay, the ten blessed companions. Now, some of you might be thinking that what does this mean? It might have been the first time that you've heard of this term, Ashra Mubashara. So, these were 10 individuals that the Prophet ﷺ, in one go, gave them the glad tidings, the good news that they are Jannati, that they are going to enter into paradise. From amongst them, the four Qulafai Rashidin, Sayyidina. Uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, Talha bin Ubaidullah, Abdul Rahman bin Awf, and Jubal bin Awam. These were, and as well as this, Sayyidina Usman al-Ghani radiallahu ta'ala, these were the five companions that Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, through his Niki Kidawat, he made uh, the individual efforts, and they accepted Islam. Sallu ala al-Habib. And Allah Hazrat Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, he says, Vodasan Jinko Jannat Ka Mujda Mila, Us Mubarak Jamaat Bila Khun Salam. So in referring to the Ashraim Mubashara, Allah Hazrat gave salam upon the Ashraim Mubashara. And SubhanAllah, Sayyidina Bukha Siddiq Rabi Allah Ta'ala had intense, uh, intense yearning for calling towards righteousness. That as soon as he got associated with the Prophet وسلم, and despite having uh, associates that, because uh, he was a well-known tradesman as well in Makkah al Mukarramah, despite this, he along with the Prophet وسلم, went to preach the religion of Islam. And they, went, they faced many difficulties. The Prophet وسلم, as well as Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, they faced many difficulties. And if only we could understand the importance of conveying the message of Islam. We are all, in one sense, a muballigh, a, a ambassador of Islam. Because when you go outside and people look at you, they won't judge you, they you know this is Haji Latif Kabeta. Okay, the armed public doesn't know your father. What they will see is this person's got a beard, this person, he looks Asian, he's probably, be a, he's probably a Muslim. So we need to be very careful that we as Muslims, our actions that we do, they could be a means of 
There could be a means of a person tarnishing the name of Islam. And nowadays we see it very common, on, uh, unfortunately in the media, the names of Muslims are being highlighted. So we really need to think, one action that I'm doing, if I'm doing this, what will be the consequences? And it's very selfish of a person to think that, you know, I'm doing this, uh, the, the only nuksan, the only negative impact is going to be upon me. I might go to jail, I might, you know, not, uh, I might have to give a fine or whatever, but no. The impact is upon the worldwide Muslims as well. Because unfortunately, the finger isn't just pointed upon that individual, but then the finger is pointed upon the entire Muslim community. So any action that we do, we need to think. Especially, unfortunately, amongst our youth. Knife crime, selling drugs, in, uh, taking drugs, okay? Uh, involving yourself in grooming guns and these type of uh, things. These are very, uh, very dangerous activities. Things which can jeopardize your own akhirat, but also can tarnish the name of Islam. And we see it in front of us, it's all over the news, I don't need to mention explicitly. So we need to understand and realize that we as Muslims, the importance that we have, a Muslim's importance has to be realized by oneself. And how will that be, be understood? That once he has his self-recognization. And unfortunately, this is one of the most uh, biggest issues amongst our Muslim community that we don't have the understanding of who we are. We are very, uh, the Muslim identity, we want to hide it. We don't feel good to be Muslim, Allah. You know, when it comes to uh, confrontation with uh, non-believers, then we try to either change our name to Mo, or if they ask us, it's Ramadan, isn't it? Are you fasting? We try to hide our fasting or don't want to explicitly show our religion. We shy about our religion. No. We are Muslims. We are the Ummatis of the Prophet We are that nation which other Prophets would make dua to be a part of. Recognize who you are. And once you recognize who you are, that's when you can understand the true importance that you have. The true uh, level that you are on. And inshallah, through this, through one's self-ability and self-development, a person can then stay away from sins and make himself as a better Muslim. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu and going back to what I mentioned at the start, that when we truly love someone, we, we, the, the claim that we have that, that we love the Prophet Sallallahu when we truly have this in our heart, then inshallah we won't be indulged in the wrongful things. Because the Ummati of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone who is an Ummati of the person who was known as Sadiq, will never tell a lie. A person who is an Ummati of the one that is called uh, Amin, would be the most trustworthy person amongst the community. But unfortunately, our Muslims are the, the most biggest of liars and the most untrustworthy people ever. And why is this? It's because we have gone away from the teachings of our Prophet. The Prophet وسلم, that gave his, uh, his, went through so many difficulties. He gave away his family for the sake of Islam. He gave away his grandchildren for the sake of Islam. Day by day, he put together the, religion, uh, the, the Muslim community and unfortunately with a few acts of ours, things that we can't uh, con have control over, we just tarnish the name of Islam. The Prophet وسلم, went through so many problems. He would stand in, at night. It's mentioned that, say, uh, that the wife of the Prophet وسلم, she saw that the legs of the Prophet وسلم, had swollen from excessive standing. And what was the Prophet ﷺ standing for? For you and me. He was making dua for you and me. That we be forgiven. That the Ummah be in the, in the control of the Prophet ﷺ. So we need to understand that the Prophet ﷺ that cried for us. The one that spent countless of nights standing and making dua in the court of Allah for us. What are we giving back to the Prophet ﷺ? What are we going to face... Uh, what, we, what face are we going to show the Prophet 
that, you know, I was the one that throughout my whole life, whenever I could, opportunity I could, whatever I could do, I try to fraud people. I try to take wrongful things. I try to uh, go into uh, things like insurance fraud or tax fraud. Well, just for an extra few pounds, you're going to tarnish the name of Islam, tarnish the name of the Prophet You can't do this. Think about your action, think about what you are doing. And as Muslims, we need to realize and understand this. And inshallah, that day is very soon, that inshallah we will. We will inshallah. We're going to have that willpower inside of us that we can inshallah stand and say, I'm a Muslim. And we can say that I'm a Muslim, I'm not going to do this wrongful thing. I'm a Muslim, I don't take uh, interest. I'm a Muslim, I don't go and indulge myself in wrongful communities. I'm a Muslim, I don't take drugs. I'm a Muslim, I'm not going to take any tax fraud or insurance fraud. I'm a Muslim, I'm not going to go into knife crime and think I'm the biggest gangster of, of Bradford. This is, inshallah, that day will soon come that we will have the ability to say no to these sins, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, Dawud Islami is helping the Ummah in uh, attracting the youth towards the masajid so that they can be away from these sinful things. <coughs> so that they can stay away from these wrongful and filthy acts. It's mentioned about a brother, a Madani Bahar, that once uh, in Karachi there was the Aam Mulaqat where Amir al sunnat he meets with the general public. And someone that came to meet Amir, Amir al sunnat he came and started to cry. Start to cry and say, Hazrat Sahib, mujhe maaf kar de, mujhe maaf kar de. And Hazrat Sahib, Amir al sunnat he asked her what is, the, what is the issue. So he told the whole story. I said this to you and you came up to me and you said, Aapne mujhe diye, main aapko deta that You gave me an invitation, I'm going to give you an invitation. And every Thursday in Gurzari Habib, we have the weekly ijtima. Please come and attend that ijtima. So saying this, Amir Islam then left. He just gave a few words of invitation towards goodness. That brother then attended the ijtima. He saw that, that the andaz of Amir Asuna, that, you know, I, was, I said something which degraded him. I was disrespectful to him, but in, in fact, what was his reaction? He didn't come and punch me. He didn't come and say, Tu kon hota? He didn't come and start swearing at me. He came, smiled at me, and gave me invitation towards goodness. So I attended the ijtima, and that ijtima changed my life. And now, when Amir Sunnat, when he was meeting Amir Sunnat, Amir Sunnat saw him, he was in full Madri Labas. Imam Sharif, Alhamdulillah, Zulf Mubarak, Dai Sharif. This is what the impact of a few words of invitation to goodness is. So we as Alhamdulillah has chosen all of the brothers here to come and attend the ijtima, to sit in the gatherings of Dawud Islam. But you, your work is now is that you go to your friends, your family, and you give them the invitation to goodness. A few words of wisdom to your friend, a few words of wisdom to your, to your younger brother, to your family, that can have a big impact. We don't know what words can bring a change in the heart of a, of a believer. So never stop giving Niki Kitabat, inshallah. And this will, inshallah, try to uh, build a better community because that is how the Muslim community was built. People would give Niki Kitabat, people would invite towards goodness. So this is how, inshallah, we're going to make our community a better place as well. That we are going to try to convey to our brother that, my brother, this is sinful, please don't do this. My brother, you know, I would advise you not to do this. And remember to do it in a good way. This is a very important aspect of making Kidawad. Now we don't shout at anyone, we don't scold them, we don't get angry at them, we don't, you know, start shouting and uh, going ballistic on them, no. We do it in a nice way. Allah says in the Holy Quran that call on the way of your Lord with good wisdom and good words. And, uh, paraphrasing the translation. So the way that we do it is in a nice way as well. The Prophet ﷺ once was walking on side, Sayyidina Anas radiallahu and he was wearing a shawl that had thick rough edges. The edges of that shawl were quite thick. And a Dehadi, a Bedouin, he came and he pulled that shawl with such a violent jerk that he left a bruise on the neck of the Prophet Now think about this situation. If this happened to us, someone on the street in town center, a beggar, he came and he pulled our jacket. What would our reaction be? Now look at the reaction of the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was his reaction? 
he turned towards that individual, turns towards that beggar, and he and he smiled at him. Subhanallah. He smiled. And what do we what would we have done? We would have probably frowned at him at least, or probably gave him a punch. But the Prophet smiled at him. And then that beggar he said, Give me from the wealth that Allah has bestowed upon you. The Prophet then ordered that wealth to be given to him. Now look at this situation. If we was in this situation, a beggar came, pulled our jacket. <coughs> What will we do? The first thing we'll do is probably react. And then if he said, give me 10 pounds, we'll probably give him 10 punches. <laughs> so this was the reaction of the best of creation. How should we react in situations like this? It's like the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And like this, we should inshallah try to have good character in every aspect. Whether we are at work, whether we are in our home, whether we are giving uh, good advice to our brother, Whatever aspect we are in, we should always uphold good character. And good character is that trait which will, inshallah, lead a man to, to Jannah. Lead a person to Jannah. As the Prophet says, I'm paraphrasing the hadith, that the most weightiest thing on the scale of good deeds, from amongst all good deeds, is good character. And why is good character? Good character isn't, Imam Ghazali, he mentions this, that good character isn't that when someone does good to you, you do good back to them. That's just an exchange of goodness. I gave you a bottle and you gave me a gift back. That's just an exchange of goodness. But good character is when someone does something bad to you, he violates your right, then you do good to that person. This is what good character is. And that is what we need to adopt in our community as well. Sallu ala al-Habib, sallallahu ta'ala, ala Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala, alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu when he went through his uh, his stages of the Tabliyyah, he came to a point where he went to a place called Taif. And I'm sure many of the brothers know about the incidents of Taif and how uh, the people of Taif scolded the Prophet وسلم, taunted him, annoyed him to the, to the extent that they made, they made their children to go and throw stones at the Prophet and the, the blessed shoes of the Prophet that we put on our Imam Ashis, that we, that we carry on our heads, that we keep close to our hearts, them were filled with, with blood. And what for? For the sake of religion, for the sake of deen. Amir Ahl Sunnah says, Hakki ra me patar khaye, khun me nahaye taif me. Hakki ra me patar khaye, khun me nahaye taif me. Deen ka kitni mehnat se kaam Aap ne ay sultan ki ka Bohut mehnat se aqa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Deen ka kaam What are we giving back to the religion? What are we as the ummatis of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Giving back to the religion that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Went through so many struggles for? We need to realize this question And I want all the brothers to go back And ponder upon this That what am I giving back to the religion of Islam? Am I giving back something which will tarnish the name of Islam? Or am I giving something back that will give strength to Islam? And you need to make that, uh, make that uh, the answer in your mind. That am I doing them actions that will lead myself, my family, my community towards goodness? Or am I doing them actions that will lead myself, my community, my household to destruction? And just for a few moments, unfortunately, just for a few moments of lust, the youth of today are jeopardizing their Iman. They're putting their Iman in so much jeopardy. And uh, unfortunately, it's not just the youth, it's also the olders as well. Getting indulged into wrongful things. And jab unko batatena, you know when we say to them that, please brother, this is not good. One to one, I'm telling you, don't do this. You go, no, Allah maaf karne wala. Ah, Allah maaf karne wala hai, but make your actions so that Allah can get pleased and forgive you. Once Sayyidina Ibrahim bin Adham rahmatullahi he was doing dua for the Holy Kaaba and he saw that a person was holding the Muftazim, holding that place where it's mentioned that the du'as are accepted at that place, the place between Babi Kaaba and Hajj Aswad. And he was making one du'a that, Ya Allah, give me death with Iman. Give me death with Iman. And this story, listen, for all those that say that Nay Allah Mahfunne wala, I'm to Aikhan me Musalmani Marenge, ye aap ke liye. So he was making that dua. And he asked that, oh individual, why don't you make any other dua? 
You are here at the place that you can make any dua and it will be accepted. Why only are you making dua that, Oh Allah, give me death with Iman. And he says that I had two brothers. Both were mu'addin in the masjid. They would give adhan every single day, five times a day. One for 60 years and one for 70 years. When the time of death came, they both called for the Qur'an to be brought. They brought the Qur'an as a means of, of blessing for them. They came and they said that whatever is in the Qur'an, I reject. They said this and died in that state. And I don't want to die in the state of disbelief. So Sidna Ibrahim al Alham said that, Oh brother, what was the reason for this? Why did they have such a bad ending? And he said, and this is an eye-opener for everyone, that they used to take interest in young boys and in non-mahram women. <coughs> interest in young boys and non-mahram women. And unfortunately, this is something which is on a thrive within our community. And we really need to understand and take heed from the verses of the Qur'an, take heed from the Ahadith al Mubarakah, take heed from our scholars that are day in, day out, struggling for the deen. Take heed from your parents that are telling you not to go and indulge in these type of things. And honor your parents, respect your parents, and change yourself. And my dear Islam brothers, the way that we can do this, one of the ways is by attaching yourself to an environment that can help you to get rid of these actions, that can help you lead the way towards Jannah. And that is, my dear brothers, Dawud Islami. I request all of you that you try to attach yourself with this environment, try to stay, stick with the brothers of Dawud Islami, keep the environment of the home religious, send your, uh, the women of the house to the sisters Ijtima'at, yourself and your children go on the Madani Qafilas, Watch Madani Muzakara, the Madani channel at home, and inshallah, you will see a change in your life and a change in the, in the life of your household as well. Inshallah, I pray to Allah that may Allah give us the ability to act what was being said and to convey uh, the message to others. Ameen. Bijahin Nabi Ameen. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallu Alaihi Habib.